Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone and once again welcome back to the 16th lecture of this course Fracture, Fatigue and Failure of Materials and in this lecture also we will be talking a little bit more about J integral and J1C in fact. So, the basic concepts that will be covered in this lecture are the following. We will be talking about uh, J1C testing one more time and then we will like to find out the differences between the K1C and the J1C testing modes and we will also like to indicate the problems that are associated with the J1C testing and a simplified approach to for the determination of J1C. So, this will be covered in this lecture covering the overall span of plane stress fracture toughness testing. So, before we begin to the, uh, the differences between uh, the similarities and the analogy between K1C and J1C, let us continue from where we left in the last lecture. We were talking about J integral and J1C which is the summation of the elastic and the plastic components. So, let us just solve a simple numerical to make this idea a little bit more clear. So, here is an example for a steel component an A C and B a single edge notched component which has the elastic modulus and uh, a ratio elastic modulus of 110 GPA and the Poisson's ratio is 0.3. And the other uh, parameters for the A C and B specimen are as follows the width is given as 20 millimeter span length which is the distance between the loading point as 80 millimeter and the thickness is 10 millimeter. It also has a crack length of 1 centimeter or 10 millimeter. Maximum load of 10 kilo Newton was applied and that yields area under the load displacement curve of 5 Newton meter square. And we need to find out the elastic and the plastic components of J integral and the overall uh, G1C value in general. So, uh, the relation all the relevant relation uh, which are obtained from the standards or the handbooks are already provided. What uh, we need to uh, perform here is a modification of the applied load to the stress intensity factor and this is related to load and the span length as well as the specimen configuration including the uh, thickness and the width of the specimen as well as a function of A by W where the details of the A by W relation has also been provided and we do not need to memorize this. Of course, we need to understand and appreciate that how if we are changing this A by W thing how uh, the overall K value is changing. So, at the very first hand let us determine the ratio of A by W. So, what we are seeing here is that crack length is given as 1 centimeter. So, which means 1 into 10 mi uh, to the power minus 2 meter and W on the other hand is 20 millimeter or 2 centimeter. We can write this for convenience as 2 into 10 to the power of minus 2 meter. So, which makes life quite easy in the fact that A by W is given by 0 0.5. So, if that is so, let us determine the uh, F A by W first because this at the first hand looks scary, but this is just a simple mathematics very high school level. So, F A by W is I am just putting these values together and you can do the calculations. So, instead of A by W now, we are putting uh, as 0 0.5 
and that makes this as 2 into 0 0.5 as 1. So, I am writing this as 2 instead and 1 minus a by w is 0 0.5. So, that makes it 0 0.5 to the power of 1.5 and this one here goes something like this. 0 0.5 into this also comes to 0 0.5 and this one here as 2.15 minus 3.93 into 0 0.5 plus 2.7 0 0.5 square. Okay. So, if we are doing this calculation uh, which is pretty simple in that sense. So, what we are getting is the f a by w is uh, 2.66. Okay. You can do the calculation very, very precisely, but it does not really matter because when we are talking about the fracture toughness any variation in the uh, in the values by digits beyond the decimal more than 2 does not really make much of a change. So, now if we need to find out the k value we also need to put the other parameter. So, let us see what we already know here is p which is given as 10 kilo Newton. So, which means 10 into 10 to the power of 3 Newton and span length is 80 into 10 to the power of minus 3 meter and b is already uh, okay b is 10 millimeter so 10 into 10 to the power of minus 3 meter and w already we know that this is 20 millimeter okay so, once again if we put all these values here, we end up getting the value of k as 75.3 MPa root meter okay. and uh, so, so that gives us a chance to find out the elastic component of J as we know that j elastic is given by k square by e 1 minus mu square. So, mu here is 0 0.3 which makes this as 0 0.9. Yeah. Okay. And if we are plugging the values of k now, and uh, so k is like 75.3 MPa root meter, and E is uh, given as 110 GPa. We need to uh, consider this uh, uh, units as MPa and convert GPa to MPa. And if we plug these values, we are getting J elastic 46.5. Kilo Newton per meter. So, we often need to convert from Pascal to Newton meter square or, or whatever is the relation that is most convenient and we have to use this. Uh, so, this uh, relation is pretty state, uh, straightforward and I want you to do this uh, along with me so that you can uh, have a feel for this and the also should know about the values which are typically seen for uh, different kind of material. So, this is an example of a metallic system you can uh, go ahead with some of the solved problems or the problems given in the exercise of the various textbooks that have been followed and then you will have an idea about the, uh, the J elastic and the J plastic component or overall fracture toughness values of materials which is very very important particularly when we are talking about the failure analysis and we want to see that how this fracture toughness can be correlated with the failure mechanisms so on and so forth. So, this is what we are getting for the elastic part for the plastic part on the other hand let me 
make it in a box and the plastic part on the other hand is given by so this is ACNB so that means eta equals to 2 so that makes it J plastic is 2 A by the ligament length and the thickness the product of that. So, area is also uh, given area of this load displacement curve as 5 Newton meter square and all the uh, other parameters of ACNB specimen are given. So, from there we can also find out the B value which is W minus A and that leads to so, W is 20 millimeter and A is 1 centimeter or 10 millimeter. So, that makes our small b as also 10 millimeter as well as the thickness is also 10 millimeter. So, if we plug these values then it is quite straightforward and we can uh, get the values of uh, J plastic as ok. So, there is not enough space, but let me still write it down here. 2 into 5. So, this is ok and so here it is 10 into 10 to the power of minus 3 and 10 into 10 to the power of minus 3. So, which makes it 100 kilo Newton per meter ok. So, this is the value of uh, the plastic component of J and overall what we are getting this is being done in a little bit haphazard way, but you can figure out how we are doing this based on this lecture. And what we are seeing is that let me write it down here for clarity. So, J plastic is equivalent to 100 kilo Newton per meter. Okay. And overall J then would be the summation of uh, this two term here or let me write it down here. So, J total will be given as 146.9. Okay. So, this is the value that we are getting from here. Okay. Now, moving on uh, to the next part, let us see that how K 1 C is different from that of J 1 C. First of all, we have seen that uh, J 1 C testing is mostly used when we are talking about ductile material and when there is a significant amount of plasticity and plastic yielding in uh, at the vicinity or in the uh, at the tip of the crack which is very very large and we cannot ignore it. In fact, the plastic zone size is almost equivalent or even more than greater than the thickness of the specimen. We see that K 1 C or the linear elastic fracture mechanics is not valid anymore and we have to consider the plastic deformation and the elastic plastic fracture mechanics becomes applicable. Okay. However, for brittle material if the material is brittle we anyway do not need to go for J 1 C at all. So, J 1 C for brittle material is same as a G 1 C that we have seen earlier. So, we do not need the plastic component and uh, include that in the calculations and the relation. So, for that it is quite easy and straightforward. Uh, the most significant difference uh, is that we have seen that how plane stress fracture toughness is applicable for thinner specimen and if the specimen is getting thicker and thicker the fracture toughness values decreases until it reaches a constant and the lowest uh, value which is nothing but the plane strain condition fracture toughness in the plane strain condition. So, there is certainly a difference in the specimen size that is required for plane strain or the plane stress fracture toughness testing although it can be ACNB or it can be CT specimen but the thickness of the specimen can be different or the overall if the thickness is different all the other parameters of an ACNB or a CT specimen are related to the thickness ok. The width and the uh, even the machine notch length everything is related. 
the small b or the ligament length. So, if uh, for that matter actually the specimen size for K1C testing is uh, it is seen that this is 20 times or even more than uh, that required for J1C testing. So, that means that we will uh, require quite bigger specimen if we are talking about K1C testing. And uh, another important fact is that what we have seen in the last lecture is that this J1C value or the critical value at the onset of fracture is determined based on 0.2 millimeter of crack extension. So, if the crack uh, extends beyond that, so that is the particular point uh, which is of interest and we determine the critical value based on that point. On the other hand, K1C correspond to 2 percent of crack extension. So, we uh, do an offset uh, method, we use the second line to determine just 2 percent of the crack extension and that is the onset of the unstable fracture or the brittle fracture. So, these are the major differences between K1C and J1C testing and uh, coming to the problems or the issues associated with J1C testing actually we have seen um, even for plane strain or plane stress fracture toughness that we need to understand or we need to have some idea or expectation about the fracture toughness values right. For any case if we need to figure out the K1C or the J1C values we need to know the KQ or the JQ values and this is dependent on the initial uh, calculation that we need to do to uh, uh, understand or determine the specimen dimension. In case of K1C testing we have seen that the thickness uh, T or B and A crack length this should be greater than 2.5 K1C by the L strength square. So, we need to have some idea about the K1C. This value we can get from the literature very well for almost all different kind of material. So, this is not an issue when we are talking about K and K1C testing, but when it comes to J1C testing once again here also we have seen that the thickness as well as the ligament length this should be greater than 25 times the JQ or J1C value by the L strength. So, in this case also we need to know that what is the J1C value. If we are doing this for aluminum or titanium we need to have some idea about that material. However, uh, most of the cases J1C values for that particular thickness is very difficult to obtain from the literatures. K1C is a standard value, it is a constant value. So, we can get this quoted for almost all materials, but J1C depends on the specimen size. So, if uh, we are doing a test here whereas someone else at the other corner of the world is doing the test on the same material and the same uh, specimen configuration, but maybe with slightly different uh, uh, B or the thickness and that can lead to difference in the J1C value. So, we cannot use that data for our purpose, right. So, that makes it quite difficult to use or to or use the concept or um, to determine it experimentally because uh, there is a literatures are not uh, available for all different kind of material for all different kind of thicknesses as well. And uh, this gets particularly critical because J1C uh, values change um, to a lot extent if there is uh, any change in the specimen dimension or even with the change in the critical load due to this non-linear stress strain behavior and that makes the assessment of J1C even more difficult. Okay. Now, to deal with that uh, there are other ways to look at this problem which has been uh, found and practiced by some of the uh, group, some of the scientists. So, this is based on a relation known as the Ramberg and Osgood relation. This signifies or this determines a stress strain relation for an elastic plastic material. So, if there is a stress strain curve like this this Ramberg and Osgood relation could be valid. So, what it says what uh, this relation actually stands on the value of strain uh, which is given by sigma by E, E is once again the elastic modulus and sigma is the stress value, epsilon is the strain value 
and this plus sigma to the power n by f. So, n is an exponent or so it is like the strain hardening exponent or so. So, it is the materials constant and uh, typically it is dimensionless which means that it has no dimension. The values of n are uh, something like n equals to 1 for elastic material. So, this is let me clarify this, this is the elastic plastic behavior. Okay. We see some part the initial part as the elastic and then we have the plastic part here. Uh, the value of n is 1 for the elastic material. So, that means uh, that in this case the stress strain curve will be something like this. So, it is following a straight line both when we are loading as well as when we are unloading it. Okay. So, that is the elastic curve. So, that is elastic material. On the other hand, the value of n equals to infinity and this is for elastic perfectly plastic material. Okay. So, in this case the stress strain curve looks like this. So, this is the stress axis on the y and strain axis on the x and in this case elastic perfectly plastic looks like something like this is ills and then it has a perfectly straight uh, horizontal uh, relation with the strain. So, that means that there is no enhancement in the stress values any further. So, this is known as elastic perfectly some common example of elastic perfectly plastic uh, material metallic material is um, for example, titanium. Okay. And okay. So, coming to that uh, E is the elastic modulus as already mentioned. And F on the other hand is a uh, materials constant let me. So, that is also a materials constant typically f have a very large value and not only that it has a dimension. So, it is not dimensional it has a dimension of or uh, say unit which is the unit of stress times the unit of n or uh, n stress times uh, stress to the power of n. So, that means, if we are using the uh, stress uh, the unit of stress as MPA and the value of n for example, is let us say 5. So, the unit will be MPA to the power of 5. Okay. So, uh, um, we have seen that the values of n also varies from 1 to infinity, 1 for elastic material and infinity for elastic perfectly plastic material. For typical metallic material, the value of n, um, let me write it down here itself. So, n va varies from 5 to 15 for metallic material. Okay. Now, uh, this is typically the Ramberg and Osgood relation, but uh, what we are seeing from here is that it has two distinct part. The first part here uh, is nothing but the elastic strain. Okay. The elastic strain is given by sigma by E, which is very familiar to all of us. We know about the Hooke's law and how stress and strain are related particularly elastic stress and strain are related to the elastic modulus and this is exactly what we are seeing. So, that is uh, nothing of concern to us. 
um, what is important also to notice here is the plastic part which is given by sigma to the power of n by f. So, that signifies the plastic deformation. Now, at uh, uh, as I mentioned that the value of f is typically very very high. So, that makes uh, this relation of this plastic part value attain a very less value if we are talking about uh, lower stress values such that uh, the, the deformation then is mostly being dominated by the elastic part and the second part here attains a very lesser value if sigma is small. So, for smaller sigma values uh, we are seeing mostly elastic deformation. Okay. This is something that we can also appreciate and understand, but when we are increasing the sigma value, then the second part increases to a high extent because it is uh, also having to the power of n. So, that makes the second part very, very large and for higher uh, sigma value actually the elastic part becomes insignificant. Okay, the plastic part dominates. So, elastic deformation is insignificant and the plastic deformation dominates. Okay. Now, if such is the case, actually we uh, came to this concept because uh, this is often used as a simplified approach for determining the J integral or the J1C values. Why? Because we have already seen the problem with J1C testing is that not many values are available in the standards or the handbooks, right. So, let us see how we can do that. So, J elastic once again is not so uh, critical because we know that this is given by K square. 1 minus mu square by E and if we are using the value of k as y sigma root over pi a. So, the very old relation that we have used so far between k and sigma. So, that and 1 minus mu square multiplied by this by the elastic modulus. So, this is quite straightforward. So, j elastic is given by y square sigma square pi a 1 minus mu square and e. And the plastic part on the other hand is given by a relation which is h into sigma into epsilon p which is the plastic strain and a which is the crack length. Okay. A is crack length here as well and we have introduced the uh, term another term h here. Now, h is materials constant which is a geometric factor essentially and that is once again a dimensionless one. And in case this material follows the Ramberg, this is particularly suitable for the material which follows the Ramberg on Osgood relation. For that case, we have seen that E or epsilon plastic part is given by sigma to the power of n by f. So, we can rearrange this relation and write that J plastic equals to H sigma and instead of epsilon plastic, we can write sigma n by f a. So, that is H sigma to the power n plus 1 a by f. So, overall we can see that j or j 1 c or j total can be obtained something like this. We can simply sum this up and solve this. So, this is the elastic part as well as we can find the plastic part also. So, we have used the three constants here n, h and f and if we have these values 
then we can determine the j quite simply. We do not need this area under the curve or do not need to do this test. So, uh, for most of the cases these values are not so difficult to find rather than the j values itself. So, that makes it quite easy and straightforward and simplified approach to find out the j integral. So, here is a uh, numerical related to that which says that uh, there is a component with an edge crack of 40 millimeter length. So, that makes the a value as let us say 0 0.04 meter and this is loaded in mode 1 with a stress value of 200 MPa. So, sigma equals to 200 MPa and the geometric factor h is considered as 8 and the material property such as the elastic modulus n. So, elastic modulus is 200 GPa. So, for clarity let me write this as 200 into 10 to the power of 3 MPa. Okay. n is given as 6.2 and f as I mentioned that f has a very high value. So, it is 10 to the power 17 and interestingly it has a unit also MPa to the power of uh, 6.2. So, if such is the case we can determine the j elastic and the j plastic values from this relation here and j elastic is once again as we have seen from the last slide itself. So, we can plug this relation here and uh, since this is uh, age crack that is mentioned here. So, we should also consider the value of y as 1.12 only for center crack we have y equals to 1 for age or surface crack we have y equals to 1.12. So, we can plug all this relation here to y square sigma square pi a and this multiplied by 1 minus mu square. So, mu we can consider this as 0 0.33 and this divided by E. So, if we are doing this we can see that the value of J elastic is coming something like uh, 28.5 kilo joule per meter square. Actually, if we plug all the values here in terms of MPa and M, then what we are getting this unit in MPa meter okay? and uh, we have to use this relation as uh, the relation between Pascal and joule as uh, Pascal is joule per meter cube and then if we use that uh, we can figure this uh, unit as well. Okay. And coming to the J plastic term, let me write it down here. So, J plastic is H into sigma to the power of n plus 1. So, in this case n plus 1 will be 7.2 into A and so divided by F. So, if we do that once again we can get the value of J plastic as 118.2 kilo joule per meter square. So, once again we have to convert the MPa meter to joule per meter square and we can attain this value. So, overall J elastic plus J plastic will be, uh, let me do this quickly. So, this is Okay. So, that comes around 146.33 kilo joule per meter square. Okay. So, that is how we can determine the J integral or the J 1 C values uh, quite in a simplified way and with this we are at the end of this plain stress factor toughness testing. Let us conclude this lecture with the following points um, which are the takeaway uh, thoughts from this lecture which says that uh, the J1C is defined for 0.2 millimeter crack e extension 
that we have seen and the ratio of the K1 C specimen to J1 C specimen is 20 which makes the K1 C specimen quite large and a simplified approach has also been shown here to determine J1 C and employing the Ramberg Osgood relation. And since the values of plane strain fracture toughness are dependent on the specimen dimension, J1 C values of a wide variety of materials are not available in standard literatures and handbooks. So, that is a drawback of J1C testing. Of course, if we have a ductile material which we know that undergoes a significant plastic deformation ahead of the crack tip, we cannot uh, go ahead with the K1C testing, then we do need to do the J1C testing and actually in practice we often need to perform the J1C testing in the actual condition for the actual specimen or the component dimension and configuration to find out the exact values. So, if necessary we do need to use this. Uh, so, that makes the J1C determination also or J integral for that matter the concept of this very very useful and we should uh, have a pretty good understanding about the fact. Okay. So, these are some of the references used in this lectures and I thank you very much.